it is a noble and worthwhile thing that every human being commit to a life of continuous growing. Growing mentally by stretching the mind. Growing emotionally by seeking a balance and emotional maturity. Growing spiritually that the walk with God goes deeper and deeper and deeper and more embracing of the great mysteries of God. We are told, however, led to believe in our culture that only mental activity, learning, using the mind is necessary for growth. For instance, I once knew a man who read the encyclopedia and he could recite something interesting about everything. But after a while, it got kind of boring <laughs> because he wasn't able to connect the emotional growth and the spiritual growth. And then we all know, well, I guess maybe you, you don't. When I was a kid, anyway, uh, I was fascinated by anybody who had read the Bible all the way through. I look forward to the day when I was old enough to do that myself. And I thought there was something very, very special about reading the Bible from the first page to the last. Until I heard two men talking one day. And one of them said to the other, you know, I've read the Bible all the way through three times. And the other one said to him, so what? What good has it done you? <laughs> the biggest spiritual challenge that any one of us has is the challenge of forgiveness. When we have been deeply hurt, when our lives have been disrupted, even radically changed, by somebody else. The challenge is to get to the place where we can forgive that person or those persons for whatever has been done to us. And that can take a long time. And it can be very, very difficult. And our title today is Forgive and Move On. And I'm going to illustrate it with a story that starts out being sort of circuitous, but I'll come to the main po point in a moment. I have a new presence in my life. He's a dog. His name is Jack. Jack is a Yorkshire Terrier, which means what they call it a Yorkie. He's 10 pounds, he's four years old, and as somebody said, who knows him well, Jack is love surrounded and embraced by fuzzy fur. <laughs> he is a dog who doesn't have a bad bone in him. And when I mentioned that, mentioned that to my wife the other day, I said, you know, Jack doesn't have a bad bone in him. And she said, well, of course, he just reflects the owner. <laughs> the personality of the owner, whatever. whatever. <laughs> anyway, if Jack was able to talk and articulate the purpose of life, Jack would say that there are two things most important in life. Pleasure and play. And I have had so much pleasure in playing with this little dog. And two things about him. He's already had his 20 minutes of fame. <laughs> A couple of weeks before Christmas, in the, my, my wife was going through the New York Times and saw a full page ad for Ralph Lauren with a little Yorkie wearing a Ralph Lauren sweater. And she said, this looks like Jack. I looked at it, and I said, Sandy, it is Jack. And we got Jack up there beside the picture, and it really was Jack. <laughs> but you don't think, well, let me take another step. And then we tried to figure it out. And she said, I, I know how it happened. Several months before, a friend of hers living in California, a very good friend, and a man who had given this dog to her, given Jack to her, was in town and wanted to take Jack for the day for whatever he was doing. He is very close friends with people in the advertising unit at Ralph Lauren. And somehow, a series, sequence of circumstances and happenings, Jack got to a photo shoot and was chosen. 
I showed it to him and he was unimpressed completely. <laughs> and then one other thing about Jack, and then I'll get serious, okay? Uh, every dog likes to fetch, fetch the ball. And most dogs, when they fetch the ball, they bring it to the person who threw it to them and they drop it down. But not Jack. I don't know if any of the dogs do this. I'm sure there are, but it was unique to me. There's a place in our living room where I roll a little ball and he will run after it and he'll come back. Doesn't drop it at my feet, but he stops three or four feet away, gets down like this, and with his nose, pushes it toward me. And we go through this over and over again. Very intense, very serious playing that he has. Anyway, now that you know Jack, and you'll hear more about Jack from time to time. Um, one night, early in the evening, I was talking with, on the telephone with Dr. Killinger. And uh, Jack came in to the study. Usually, Yorkies walk with a, 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 an attitude. Okay? And, but he came in dragging. His ears were down, shoulders were down, moved very slowly, and tried to get between me and the chair that I was sitting on. And I said, something's going on. In a moment's time, I heard his mother, my wife, say, Jack, where's Jack? And she picked him up and she brought him to the place of the crime where he could wee weed on, the, on a brand new rug. <laughs> I heard in the background one of the most intense scoldings I have ever heard a dog or a human being get. And she's never scolded him before, but she was so upset with him. She wanted him to learn the lesson never to do it again. The Jack spent the first hour under the bed. <laughs> then he came out into my study and he wouldn't leave me. Either on my lap, on my shoulder, or at my feet. From time to time, I'd walk out and I'd say, Sandy, uh, how long is this going to last? Aren't you going to make up with it? <laughs> and she said, I'm not ready. I'm not ready. And then a couple of times she said, tomorrow morning, tomorrow morning, but not tonight. The last chore that I do every night is I take the garbage and I take it to the incinerator room and down the chute. Jack has never, ever gone with me before. But he walked out there just hanging on, touching me all the time. When we were walking back to the apartment, he stopped about 10, 10 feet before. And I said, come on in, Jack. He wouldn't budge. He was afraid to go in. So I picked him up and uh, put him down. I said, Sandy. She said, tomorrow morning. <laughs> Finally, I was ready to go to bed, and I, I just felt sorry for this little guy. He was just hurting so badly. So he knew he had done something wrong, and he was feeling guilty and bad. And so I said, Sandy, I want to go to bed. Would you please apologize to Jack? <laughs> okay. I also wanted to say that when she was scolding him, she said such things as, you will never sleep in this room again. You're not going to be here tonight. And I thought, she was near the door. And you know in apartments, you can hear through the door. And if a neighbor was walking by, they would have thought it was she was talking to me. <laughs> and they would have said, that preacher is in trouble. <laughs> anyway, so she did say, OK, come on in, Jack. And she said, I'm sorry, Jack. And she hugged him, and she loved him. And we lived happily ever after. <laughs> what this was all about, very simple. You forgive so that you can move on. If you don't forgive, you can't move on. Excuse me. The other day, I got a call from a member of this church, a young man, uh, who said, I hear you, see you're preaching on forgiveness on Sunday. He said, five or six years ago, you said, gave a sermon on forgiveness, which really helped me. And uh, he said that he was very much in love with a young woman and I had met the young woman, and, and I had seen the love between them. It was one of the most electric, ecstatic presences of seeing, seeing the two of them interact that I've ever seen. It was wonderful. But something happened that she changed her mind and her heart, and she broke up the relationship. He was deeply hurt and began to get bitter. And he said, what that sermon did for me was to help me get to the point where I wanted to forgive and then just work the process of forgiveness. And he said, you had a quotation, which meant a lot to me. And we did some digging back, 
and he got me a copy of the quotation. And it's some words written by the present current theologian, Fred Beekner. This is what he said. When you forgive someone who has wronged you, you are spared the dismal corrosion of bitterness and of wounded pride. Descriptive words. The bitter, sacred, spared the dismal corrosion. We know what dismal means. Corrosion, we know what that means. Eating away of bitterness and what bitterness does to us and wounded pride. And we know what pride can do to us. When we don't forgive, we get bitter. A corrosive thing goes on within us. And so what can we do to forgive so that we can indeed move on and keep growing? First thought is, face the fact of the hurt. Face the fact and deal with what, what, what has happened to you. Spell it out in your mind. Think it through. Then get in touch with the anger. One of the problems that I had as a young man growing up is that I would not admit to anger and I would swallow it. And it had very negative effects on my health. So, denied anger, swallowed anger is basically unhealthy as well as unwise. But face the fact of what's going on, get in touch with the anger, not exploding, not machine gunning it at the other person. Sometimes it's appropriate to talk to the other person and say, I'm angry, you've done this to me, I've got to work it through, I want one day to forgive you. And sometimes it's not appropriate, but deal with it yourself. And never use the anger to, to machine gun or destroy the other people. Because when you do that, Everybody loses. Then watch out for bitterness and revenge. We are a people who love to get revenge. That's the problem that's going on in the Middle East, in many other parts of the world, and in our relationships. I've got to get back at that person. I've got to hurt them as they have hurt me. Once again, when that happens, everybody Everybody loses. There is no winner. I had an experience a number of years ago when I was a graduate student at a school for religion and psychology in Houston, Texas. And part of our training was to have a therapy group. And I had quite an experience with that year in that therapy group. And this, in this particular group was a husband and his wife. I'm going to call her Sue. It's not her real name, but I'm going to call her Sue. And Sue was one of these people who was always happy and glib and giving advice. And the other thing we knew about her, beyond the experience of happiness and glibness and so forth and giving advice, is that she wanted to have a baby. But when anybody would ask her, how are you doing, Sue? I'm fine. Everything's great. I'm doing fine. And here, through the weeks, everybody else in the group was bearing their soul, getting their feelings out, the struggle, the anger, the hurt, and so forth but never Sue. Everything was fine with Sue. People would confront her. I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm all right. Everything's good. And then one night, she said, I've got to talk. And she took over the entire meeting. And she said, I've got to admit to everybody that I am very unhappy and I am miserable. I hate my mother. And because I hate my mother, I hate myself. Then she told of what it was like to be a little girl in her family home, and what her mother was like. She said, my mother was a woman who would go to church every Sunday, was very well dressed, was very nice, well respected, but at home she was a terror. When I would do something wrong, there were two favorite types of punishment she would mete out to me. One was having me sit in the attic for hours on end, in the winter when it was cold, in the summer when it was hot, but I would have to stay in the attic. And the other thing she did was sometimes to fill the wash basin, basin in the bathroom with water. Stick my head into it. Hold me down until I said, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I promise never to do, it, do, to do it again. So this was some of the background that Sue was raised with. She got the anger out. It was explosive. 
It was almost mean she was so angry. And then as time went on, she would say, you know, this anger is getting to me. It's beginning to destroy me. I've got to learn how to forgive my mother. And she had friends of hers and her groups in, the, in the, her church praying. She asked this therapy group to do the praying for her, to help pray for her and to help her out. And in time, she came to the place where I started a meeting again. And she said, I want to tell you something. I have just had an epiphany. I have had a release. I am free from my mother. I have forgiven her. This took many months, a lot of work, a lot of expression. But she got to the point of forgiveness. Six weeks later, she came to the group meeting and she said, guess what? I'm pregnant. And as she understood the dynamic of what went on, she said, I was afraid if I had a child that I would treat that child as my mother treated me. And I know that is not going to happen. Face the reality of the situation where somebody has hurt you. Face it. Don't deny it. Deal with the anger. Not destructively, but constructively. And ask God for help in praying through and getting beyond the hurt to forgiveness. There are two short verses in the book of Matthew, the 18th chapter, where Jesus and Peter are in conversation. And Jesus said something there which has reverberated in my mind over and over and over again since I first heard it as a child. Peter said, how many times should I forgive if somebody has done something against me? Seven times? And I'm going to expand on the conversation now. This is not in the Bible, but it's what I think probably happened. Peter, I'm going to tell you something. You don't understand. Forgiveness is not quantitative. You don't count the number of times you have forgiven somebody. But it's qualitative. It has to do with the attitude and the position of your mind. It has to do with your loving that person and with your ability to forgive, to have a forgiving spirit and this is the essence of what forgiveness is all about it's learning to love even the person who has hurt us and it's possible one last story and that is and one last thought and that is that forgiveness happens best when God is brought in and you trust that God is going to give you the leadership that you need to forgive that person it might take a long time one of the persons who hurt me more than anybody else is somebody that I could, I could not forgive, I could not get this person out of my mind, the anger the, the and resentment, the bitterness so I was instructed to pray for him for two solid years Every day, I prayed for that man. And then one summer morning on a morning walk, a message came through which said, you don't have to pray anymore. The next day I prayed again, a message came back. You don't have to pray anymore. Because I realized that I had forgiven him. I had released him. And at least I was free. Free from that man. God will help you in any situation. And many of you remember the name Cory Ten Boom, a Dutch lady. A couple of years before she died, somebody said that she was in church one Sunday morning, sat in the back row, just came in and went out. And I'm sorry I didn't know that because I would have loved to have met her. She was in a concentration camp during the Second World War. And her sister, among others, were killed in that camp. And she realized that after the war, the only thing that could bring healing to Europe and the rest of the world was love expressed in forgiveness. And so she was traveling all over, preaching the message of forgiveness. She was in a church in Germany, in the basement where she had given a talk. And afterward, people came up to greet her. 
And at one point, a man came up and said, Fräulein, Fräulein, isn't it wonderful that we forgive? And she froze. She was filled with hatred. This was a man that directed her sister's death. And she wondered, how can I shake this man's hand? And the kind of internal desperate plea, this all happened in a few seconds. Please that we may, God, help me, God be here, God be here. She reached out, shook his hand, and as she did, as she described it, there was an energy like electricity that went through my body and through my hand and his body. And she said, in that instant, I forgave him. Then we look to the example of Jesus. He taught forgiveness. But when we give serious thought to what he did, it's beyond awesome. It's only of grace. As he moved through the last weeks, last days, and the last hours of his life, pain, disappointment, testing, Two things, two forces were working against him. The public people, the institutional church people, they wanted him to be crucified. They wanted him out of the way. For them, he was a troublemaker. His support group, his disciples, who he really needed at his hour of deepest need, were not there for him. And can you imagine when you're going through a difficult time, that your closest friends and support are not there for you? How much that hurts, how badly that feels? That was the dynamic that Jesus was living with. And, but what did he say on the cross? A prayer. Father, forgive them. Forgive them. For they really don't know what they're doing. And he died. And please know that Easter never would have happened. The resurrection never would have occurred if he had not forgiven. There are resurrections due in your life and in mine as we get to the point where with God's help we forgive and then move on. Let us pray.